There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next edition of Saturday Chat Live here on Saturday, May 6, 2023. I'm so glad that you are all here for the chat. It's sort of the end of the school year and summer is upon us. And, you know, I can feel it outside. It's really nice here where I'm at. And um, I'm going to sit outside later today and enjoy it. So I hope you all are doing fantastic. I'm so happy you all are here. And I do have a few things to get out of the way at first, and then we'll open up the chat and everything for questions, comments, whatever we usually do. If you're new here, here's how this works. I try to keep the live stream to, to, to between 30 and 60 minutes. Um, that way you can get on with your day, and I have stuff to get on with. I don't want to sit and waste anyone's time, including my own. So we'll keep it to that sort of range, depending on how the conversation goes. You are free to post any comments, thoughts, or whatever else in the chat. I will do my very best to answer them here live, but there are some questions I can't get to live or they're more complex um, or I might have to do research or whatever else to answer those uh, quickly. So I will do the best I can to answer whatever questions you might have here in person. All right, so what is up? Um, first thing I wanna do is I wanna give a shout out to all the amazing baristas up at the coffee shop. I do almost all my YouTube work at. I get there at like 7.30 in the morning some days, and on the weekends I go up there, and uh, they're really nice to me and let me sit and do the work, and they help me turn coffee into YouTube videos. So I, I think some of them might be watching today because um, eventually they're like, well, when do you live stream? I'm like, well, so every other Saturday. So I think they might be watching, so I want to give a shout out to all of them up at the coffee shop for taking care of me and giving me a space uh, to do work because that leads to videos for you all. All right, so that's the first thing I wanted to get um, out of the way is to thank them. Uh, second thing I wanted to talk about is that I've been recently getting a lot of requests through LinkedIn and through my website and stuff to like work on people's very involved projects, like sending me like massive tech, you know, emails or whatever else to like help them with their work. And as much as I would love to do stuff like that, there's just no possible way. I can do involved things like that. You know, if it's a quick hitting type of question that I can answer in a couple minutes, I can do stuff like that. But, you know, I have a full-time job, YouTube, and another part-time job, and there's just, in a house to keep up, there's just no way to get to all that. I have very little free time as it is. So um, I do my best. But if your question is short and only takes a minute or two to, to answer, the best place is on LinkedIn or you can send me a message through my website. I wish I had 36 hours in the day to help everyone I possibly can, uh, but that just isn't the reality. So I do the best I can, okay? So uh, next thing is that, yeah, we'll be back here in two weeks on the 20th. So plan for that if you wanna stop by the live stream, same time, same place. So I will see you then. Also, some news is that, if some of you probably know, my day job is working for Cengage Group, formerly Cengage Learning, and we make you know books and courseware for college students and stuff like that. As I mentioned, we have some new stuff out that I want to share with you really quickly. So, as you all know, um, many of you ask about what what books to maybe to look at as a reference or to maybe go find used and have on your shelf if you need some help with statistics or analytics or whatever else. And I always recommend the books I've been using as a tutor and teacher for the past 10, 15 years. And by serendipity, I happened to end up working at the company that made the very book that I used to tutor before I ever knew that company existed. And uh, we just came out with an, uh, the next edition of the book that is the best book um, for learning stats for like you know introductory stats, like an undergraduate level stats. And it's the 15th edition, and it is out. So it is out. So if, there it is, Ta -da, right there. So this is my day job. I help, I'm on the product team that helps make these. And uh, we have a, such a very talented team. And I do want to give a shout out to everyone on the team that helps uh, make these things. Whatever you think, whatever effort you might think goes into making something like this, multiply it by 10. That's the amount of effort that it takes to go into making not only the book, but all the online homework and the supplements that we make. It is a tremendous amount of work that lasts years, you know, can last over a year. 
So I want to give a shout out to all the people on the, the product team that helped make this. Of course, all of our salespeople um, and everyone that goes into making this the market leader by far in stats. So if you are at a university um, or you know want to find a used copy of this to put on your shelf, you won't find any used copies of this because it literally it it still smells you know like it was printed. So, but this is the book. So shout out to everybody that um, helps make this on at work. I appreciate it. And if you like the way I teach, if you like the way I teach, it's because it's informed by this book. So it's great. And drum roll. We also have the new business analytics book. Same author team. This is not a fifth edition. It is a monster book. It is awesome. Um, I've showed you the fourth edition before. So this is the brand new fifth. Still smells like ink. I love it. Um, added chapters on data mining. We split the, uh, the classification and uh, regression tasks into two chapters. And it is a beast. It's a beast. So this is the business analytics book that kind of goes along with a lot of a lot of people, a lot of schools, will do a two semester sequence of these two. So stats and then the analytics. Um, is what we, m most, I don't say most, but many schools do. So if you can find this book, like the, the previous edition um, used, another one to put on your shelf, okay? Tremendous amount of work. And we were doing these two at the same time, at the same time. So it was, it's been a hellacious, past like 18 months getting this stuff out. Um, so those are that. And we also have a third one just really quickly um, that I have here. This is our operations book, different authors, um, David Collier. But this is our um, ops and management. We call it OSCM for short. This one just came out as well. So hey, this is my day job, you know, this is what I do. Um, day in, day out, nine to five, nine to five now. And um, again, very proud of all of our authors, all of our, my coworkers and, and managers that helped make all that stuff possible and make, you know, at least the first two books, um, by far the market leaders across the United States, hands down. So I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone involved. All right. So go ahead and start placing your comments, questions, whatever else you have. Um, in the chat, I'm going to go start going back through those and reading through them and answering whatever questions and putting some of the comments up on the screen. Next thing I want to uh, mention is if you if you did not notice, I released a new video last weekend on Holt double exponential smoothing. So if you haven't checked that out, please do. It is um, right uh, right here. If I can find it, there it is. It's right here on Holt double exponential smoothing. I'm very proud of that video. I think educationally, pedagogically, it's one of my best videos because I took time to really put it together. And um, yeah, if you've ever had an interest in you know that sort of topic or time series in general, please check that out. It obviously helps me in the channel. Um, you know, even if you just let it play, like just let it play, thumbs up even if you're not necessarily interested in time series. Um, yeah, go ahead and take a look at that. It's pretty cool. I'm really, I'm really happy with that one. And um, it's been doing you know pretty well for my content. Again, my content doesn't get a lot of initial views, but they just build up slowly over time because it's like a library of content. And that's kind of how I view, view my stuff, all right? Um, so that is released. I'm working on the next video. So when I leave here, I'm going to go up to said coffee shop for just a little bit. So I do want to come back home and sit on the deck and enjoy the beautiful day. But I'm going to go up there for a little bit, get started on that. I already have a rough outline. I have it started. And hopefully that'll be out in the next week or two. And um, that will be on some topics related to autocorrelation and autoregression. But you can kind of see where we're leading to, right? We're starting off. We kind of start off with the simple stuff, and then we get into more complex things. And then, you know, we just kind of build it up layer by layer by layer. So the next video will be about autocorrelation, autoregression uh, type topics, Durbin Watson statistic, and things like that. Okay? So I'm working on it. Trust me. I need some water. All right. 
So, um, excellent. So that video is out. New ones on the way. Of course, while I have the browser shared, um, keep in mind I do have a website here. If you're looking for um, playlists, you can find those here. This is a detailed uh, list of all the playlists, the number of videos in them. If you hover over it, it'll tell you how many videos, the length, the average length. Click on the button, it takes you right to the playlist if you want to binge watch, binge watch a certain topic. I don't have the time series stuff on here yet because I was waiting to build it out first. But now that I'm into the third playlist, I'll probably go ahead and put the time series stuff in the next month or so on here. Now that there's enough content to put on here, okay? I also have the PDF companion guides that help support the channel. So I have four companion guides for the most popular playlists on my channel. You can uh, purchase those, they're not, they're not expensive at all. And you get hundreds of pages of content, okay? So you get, um, you get an image of, the sl of every slide, the time code where that slide is, a link to that place in the video that goes with that slide and the transcript for, this, for these entire playlists. So descriptive stats is 250 pages. The ANOVA one is 350 pages. The simple regression one is 400 pages. The multiple regression one is 200 pages. So for less than 20 US dollars, you get that and it helps support the channel. I'm not sure how long I will offer these because it actually costs almost as much to host them and, and do the payment and everything as it does people that buy them. So um, if you want them, you might wanna get those soon because I'm not sure economically if it makes sense. Also a download page here. So if you're looking for a data set or an Excel file that goes with one of the videos, you can find that here on the website as well. You just find the one you're looking for. It'll mention it in the description or in the video itself. You can find it. You can have them all right here, okay? And likewise, that's thing I always like to show people, and I'll get to the comments and the questions right after this. If you have a simple question, you can contact me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way because I'm on there constantly. Uh, and or here on the website if you like if you prefer to do this if you're not really on LinkedIn or whatever else there's are the two best ways to get a hold of me if you have a quick comment question or whatever else I cannot do your dissertation for you I cannot do your homework I cannot help you with your work project that takes hours of time so if it's quick I'll do my best okay all right I wish I had all the time in the world but it's not the reality for any of us is it so all right Okay, where are we at here in the chat? Piper, what's up, man? Hope you're doing fine. Hope you're doing good. Clyde, oh, I want to hear how, thing went, how things went for you, Clyde. Okay, I want to, I want to, if I'm getting that right, I think you had some things you were working on, unless I'm completely hallucinating, like chat GPT. Um, I say, Glenn, hey, Brandon, stop listening to your positive motivational vibe. Coffee shops are the best. Absolutely. That's always where I've done my sort of best thinking work for, for years. So when I was in, uh, when I was at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, IU Bloomington, I basically spent as much time at Barnes & Noble in the cafe working as I did like at home. I mean, I would literally close the place down. I would just sit in there and do my work, do my reading for class or for my teaching. I was teaching at the time. I would tutor students at Barnes & Noble. So I like lived at that Barnes & Noble. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. But um, yeah, and that's just where I do my best sort of work. I'm very particular about my environment. Like at home, I do certain things better here. At the coffee shop, I do, cert do certain things better there. Um, on my walks around the park, I do certain podcasts. So I do certain things better there. I'm very sensitive to my environment in the coffee shops. I've always just been where I just, I'm very productive. I like the noise and the smell of the coffee. And of course you get to know people there. So it's, uh, it's my, my favorite place. On that note, Clyde says, hi baristas, you're doing God's work. Yes, they are. All the baristas up at the coffee shop are fantabulous. And, um, yeah, they, they do a, they do a good job. Just kind of I won't say taking care of me, but they're always very friendly, of course, and uh, give me a good place to work. It's literally three and a half minutes down the road. If I hit the lights, I can get there probably in two minutes. 
but uh, it's very close and it's good to do, sit there and do some work. So, all right. <clears throat> Hello from Starbucks. Um, maybe that's one of them. Um, hand pink waving, okay, hand pink waving. Um, I told them I was streaming today and tried to remind them so they might, some of them might have watched the beginning. So Glenn says, two math classes left for my math degree, excellent. Doing real analysis and then I have abstract algebra. I can see the goal line. Congrats, Glenn. That's awesome. Congratulations. You're almost there, my friend. I know you do great work and have really worked hard since I've sort of known you through the channel. And um, I'm happy for you. We're all happy for you. And yeah, we'll look. We'll, so, we'll all celebrate virtually once you cross the goal line. And we'll, we'll, we'll celebrate you getting to the goal line, of course, you know, on your way. Clyde says, Glenn, that's amazing. Congrats. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, we should all celebrate each other's success, you know, which it, is, it's really helpful for people just to feel motivated and to get some reinforcement. And um, we've, we all need that to some extent, you know, I mean, some people really need a lot of that kind of stuff, which is great. Some people need just a little bit of that to kind of get themselves going. But at, I think on some level, we all need that support, need that motivation. And I think it's up to us, whether it's our family, friends, um, romantic partners, coworkers, whatever else, to teach them what we need in terms of that kind of motivation and support. So we all need that. And, um, you know, I'm glad that you're doing well, Glenn, and so many other uh, of you that are related to the channel and here in the live stream are doing well, doing well too. Okay. It just makes, it makes my job so much better. And I was thinking the other day that, you know, YouTubers, ed YouTubers, YouTubers like myself, um, a lot of us, you know, we're not racking up, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on videos. We're not making very much money on YouTube doing this sort of thing. So you have to have some other motivation to do it, right? And what I was thinking the other day is that of all the joy and happiness I get out of doing what I do on YouTube, 95% of that happens before I ever hit the publish button. So the joy of making the content and, and making, you know, pedagogically how it's all going to flow and making, you know, the slides and doing the research and doing the problems over and over and over again. And the, the work that's going on in my brain and just in my heart about doing meaningful work, 95% of the joy I get out of doing this happens before I ever hit publish. And I think that's a good place to be, you know. Uh, it helps that I have a, another full-time job that allows me to do YouTube when I can. And if I don't have time, I can't. You know, it's just the reality. But I, the joy I get out of it actually is in the, in the process of making it. And um, I'm actually reading a really interesting book right now. As you know, I'm always reading multiple books. So the book I'm reading now is really sort of an anthology, sort of a history of YouTube. And it really get, kind of goes through chronolog chronologically the internal workings of YouTube, the external factors, and some of the challenges it's faced and, and things like that. And it really shows how some creators just really get completely crispy fried. And some creators just really get overwhelmed by external things and they lose the happiness and joy that they started with in making the content and, and stuff like that. I don't want to get that way. So that's why I take my time and sort of measure out. I do what I can when I can. I make sure it's high quality because my content is meant to last decades, you know. And now some of my earlier content has now crossed the decade mark. And it, some of them are still some of my most watched videos. So just a lesson for mental health, you know, emotional health, and stuff like that. So, all right. What else we got here? Trisha, you are my hero. Oh, that's, that's so kind of you, Trisha, but I appreciate that. Thank you for the, for the compliment. 
Um, but I, right back at you, you know, you are my hero too. All of you are. Look, if you sit down and take 20 minutes of your life, 30 minutes of your life maybe sometimes, and dedicate that to watching one of my videos, you have given me the most valuable thing that you have, and that is your time. So I deeply appreciate that. And that's why I work really hard to make the content high quality, even though it takes a bit more time. So you're my hero too, Tricia, and I accept and appreciate your compliment. Um, second stats class is my last before beginning my dissertation um, with a terrible professor. Um, was not passing before I found you. Will end with a passing 83 or B minus. It almost did me in. Thanks. Well, you are very welcome, Tricia. That's, you know, people like you are the reason why I do the channel in the first place. It's just offering that resource to help people out who need it. But it's like the old, you can't lead a, you know, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't force it to drink. And people like me can put up content on YouTube for people to watch to get help. But if that person's not willing to put in the time to watch and, you know, and absorb that help, if they just want a quick fix, then that's probably not going to work. But, you know, those like you who put in the time to watch and make the effort to do it are the real heroes in this story, you know? So, so kudos to you, you know, whatever I was able to offer you in the end did all the hard work. And, you know, when you get that, you know, the dissertation started, which that's where my PhD fell apart mainly because of the recession in uh, 09. That's when I was starting that process and the bottom fell out of everything. Um, and I kind of had lost interest in higher ed, which was probably prescient, but, um, but you know, kudos to you and keep on going on a dissertation. So we want to see PhD. Okay. Clyde Brown, um, great motivation is a great model for learning, teaching and sharing. It's very kind of you, Glenn. Thank you. So, so much. I appreciate that. And hey, like everyone else, I'm a, I'm partly a product of all the past teachers and experiences I have had. And whatever I'm able to offer is really this sort of the multiplicative, pro, you know, um, result of having great teachers myself, having parents that didn't really have a whole lot when they started, that really focused on education for me and my brother. And we just kind of fell in love with that sort of thing. Me especially. I've always loved school, always had great teachers. And, you know, without them, I wouldn't be doing this. So, you know, I just, I'm just a, a long part of the lineage of great educators that I've been blessed to have in my life. And hopefully, you know, the, that work continues through some of you all, whether it's through your careers or some of you decide to become educators in some way. And by the way, Education doesn't have to be formal. So passing the torch forward can be very informal, whether it's, you know, you're helping out a sibling or a, ch uh, uh, a child or a friend or whatever else. That, those are all ways to pay it forward. And we should all, you know, try to do that when we can. All right. Um, Clyde says, you're not hallucinating. I started some probability and combinatorics work for a small video game studio. Excellent. Where'd he go, Clyde? Excellent. <clears throat> Going well, I'm calculating some poker probabilities, but with several twists that make the math challenging and interesting. Absolutely, that's that's so fun. Um, I'm not really a gambler. It's funny you said that. I'm not really a gambler. But if I, the, the few times I have, you know, played cards or whatever, it's been blackjack because the rules are pretty clear on what you do at every situation. And when it's not clear, it's basically a 50-50, just roll the dice, a coin flip. So um, I have played blackjack in the past, but uh, I'm not much of a gambler or anything like that. So, but good. I'm happy for you, Clyde. I'm really glad that it, that's working out for you and you're getting, you know, joy and meaning out of the work and, 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 and some intellectual stimulation out of the work and hopefully a little moolah out of the work too. Hey, I'm a realist. Right? Got to pay them bills. Um, all right, Glenn. I volunteered to write a tutorial for a Python, Python library on agent-based modeling. It has been suggested that I look at something called um, diataxis. 
to consider as a documentation model. I'm not familiar with that, but I have my trusty notebook. I will write it down and just take a look. I like, I'm just learning what things are, learning what things are. All right. So yeah, I'm not familiar with that sort of model, but I will look it up. I will look it up. Once I'm realizing like, sometimes when I go look at frameworks for doing tutorials and of course I've had my undergraduate degrees in math and science education, my master's degree is in curriculum instruction and my doctorate would have been in curriculum instruction. So I've obviously, I've obviously had many, 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 many education classes. Um, but a lot of my way of doing things is more intuitive and it's just sort of ingrained by being a learner. So all the great teachers I've had over the years throughout my entire life, I have, I guess by osmosis, absorbed what they did and I turned it into self-teaching and that comes out in my teaching. Uh, so I'm, I, will, I will read some educational theory or whatever else or, or guide tips or guides for education and I'm like, well, yeah, I do that. Um, but I'm always, you know, looking to learn, you know, new ways and new ideas about doing this stuff. So, all right. Um, Clyde says, I'm not a gambler either. <laughs> I've learned a lot about poker this week. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, poker especially because you're playing like against other players is, is as much psychological as it is mathematical. So maybe even more so, but it's fun. Um, me and my friends in high school play a lot of Euchre because that was really fun. All right, what else we got here? Um, hi, Brandon. Uh, could you start a playlist on machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, and semi-supervised? Uh, maybe, I've thought about that. I've definitely thought about doing something like that. There are a couple of challenges to that. Number one is just time. So obviously YouTube is not my full-time job. It can't be my full-time job because it doesn't pay enough to even feed myself. Um, of course, there's no insurance or nothing like that if you, if you do it full-time. So might I do that someday? Maybe. When? I don't know. The other challenge is that there's so much content out there already on these kind of topics because uh, there was that big, huge data science machine learning boom uh, a few years ago. There's so much stuff already out there. I am not sure what else I would add to that that would be different or unique or whatever or whatever else. It would have my teaching style, of course, but I don't know if it's a, if it's a big enough addition to the already existing canon of videos and knowledge that are already there to justify spending all the time doing it. So maybe at some point, I don't know. So I, I'm always honest. I'm not sure if I'll get to those type of topics when or if anytime sort of soon. As I mentioned before on, on this live stream, I have like 10 other directions I could take the channel in terms of different content areas after I do some more time series stuff and I haven't decided on what path that will go, but that's one, that's one potential path, one potential path. All right. Good question. I want to put this, um, what are your ideas on generative AI? So that's a good question. So I want everyone, if you're, if you're anyone who wants to, to um, chime in, share your experiences using chat GPT. And I put an asterisk there because it doesn't have to be chat GTP. It could be any sort of generative AI that's similar to that, any other AI chat bot or any other you know, image AI like mid journey and table diffusion or any audio AI like 11 labs or whatever else. What have been some of your experiences using these tools? I am interested to learn and go back here. So what are my ideas on this? I have many ideas on generative AI. So maybe if you want to be more specific, so I don't sit here and blab, um, you know, please put that in the chat. I'm more than happy to chime in on my thoughts on any sort of specific thing, but just overall, you know, I'll say overall, 
I think is it's it's obviously a revolutionary and um, just new era defining technology that was you know in been in the making for the past ten years or so. Uh, I'm not sure we're prepared for it, you know, in terms of you know how it will affect businesses and jobs, government regulation around it, privacy, uh, intellectual property, and stuff like that. Also, the, the resources it takes to, to do these things right now, you know, I mean, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to run these things for a year. So many GPUs they have to obtain to do this kind of stuff. So I think, I think we kind of put the cart before the horse on this, and it's going to take some time for everything to sort of even out and, and figure out how things are going to, you know, pan out lot of outs. But I do see some things that overall that are happening, I think are sort of good. So, you know, OpenAI changed their terms of service last month to state that if you're using their API to access ChatGPT, if you're using the API, then they will not use your data to train their model. Because a lot of companies, including mine, many other companies were like, we're not going to we're not going to give you our stuff. I think we're insane. You know, you've probably heard the stories about proprietary company data showing up in ChatGPT. So I think the push to rein in some of the privacy concerns around using proprietary data for the model will be a boon. So companies like mine and other companies like Microsoft and whoever else that wants to use these tools know that their data is protected if they're using the API. Now, if you go into like ChatGPT Plus and drop in proprietary data in there, that's not the same thing. You're not using their API. So they, they can use any of that. So um, so I think there, and there are some talks about, you know, government regulation around it in terms of privacy and intellectual property. I think the EU will probably take a lot of leading role in that discussion because they have experience like with Facebook and other stuff, you know, around privacy, GDPR. So we'll see. But there are a lot of subtopics within that that are really interesting. So if you all want to put those in there, I'm more than happy to opine on those and I'll share your comments as you put them in the chat. Sean. Hey, Sean, how you doing? Excellent. Excellent to see you, my friend. Sorry, I was distracted for a second. It's good to see you, Sean. Thank you for stopping by the live stream. I hope you are doing well, my friend. It's good to see you in here again. Um, so Jet, uh, chat GPT is the latest trend on generative AI, right? Well, I think it sort of is the main one, you know, but this, but this, the tech, the underlying technology has so many applications. It's a general AI, right? So, Back in the day, when these algorithms were first being developed, they were very specific, very specific. So you could train a model on like a dog. You could feed it millions of images of what a dog is. Label it a dog, here's an image. Label it a dog, here's an image. But when you would give it like a horse, it wouldn't tell you it's a horse. All it could tell you was that it's not a dog. Okay? That's what I mean by specificity. These general uh, AI tools can be used across so many different applications and mediums, right? So the thing about this technology is that the chatbots are just one slice of this overall massive picture. So obviously, like the image generation tools, like Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, Dali, stuff like that, that's one way that's it's being applied. The same basic technology, but applied that way. Um, voice, like Eleven Labs and other stuff like that, same way. Synthesia, which is like AI video and audio kind of together. Um, what are some other ones I'm thinking of? Uh, Canva, like tools like Canva have generated so, many, so much AI tools into their stuff now, which is just mind-bogglingly good and crazy for, for what it is. So what else is Runway? Uh, Runway is another really interesting one that deals with video and images and stuff. So 
it's just much, much broader than just the things that get necessarily the most attention in popular media and stuff like that. But I think we're not ready for the disruption that's going to happen and is already starting to happen in certain industries, you know? So, you know, especially, and honestly, especially in education, right? So, I don't know. It might, it might make people like me obsolete, you know? So... I'm not sure if it'll make people like me who do what I do completely obsolete, but it might shrink down the available audience to just people who really like the personal touch and want to like see a human being. So we will see. Um, so Glenn says, chat GPT is a type of generative AI, specifically a large language model, LLM. I use it frequently to uh, replace Google searches for definitions. Yeah, it's one use. Um, and the other thing about these tools right now, and it's been said before, it's not anything like profound from me. The thing about all of these tools now is that right now is the worst they'll ever be. They're only going to get better with more usage, with more reinforcement feedback, with more data to use. They're only going to get better and better and better because that's the way they work. Now, of course, we have to look out for some of the the downsides to them, you know, if they're using language, of course, they are built off human language. Therefore, any misinformation and biases uh, and other type of stuff that, you know, can get really, really, really awful. If it learns from those sorts of things, it can become embedded in the model. So there has to be some sort of way of kind of looking at correcting for that. And there's actually an argument is that should be. I don't know. You know, it's... um. It's a hard, you know, it's a hard decision sometimes. You know, you want to balance, you know, open access and free speech and stuff like that without just being completely awful. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it, right now they're only going to get better, but I think the most interesting aspect is how they will be integrated, how this technology will be integrated into a second tier or third tier of things. So, you know, Ch uh, chat GPT is awesome, but I think its user interface is awful. You know, I think just having the previous chats on this side, you can't really organize them. You can't label them. You can't put them into folders. You can't like, you can't organize your stuff, you know? Um, and like it generates a response, but it should have like a copy button there. Like, you know, maybe it does. I don't know. But I just think the interface is pretty bad. But how it is integrated into a second and third tier product like a Canva or, you know, Google Docs or Microsoft Office or whatever will be like the next level of everything. And it's just going to be wild, wild, crazy. From here on out, it's just going to be a wild, crazy ride. I don't know. So. Um, is image classification possible with chat GPT? Um, well, chat, G chat GPT is just a chat bot. So all it does is respond to queries in text that you ask it. You know, and prompt engineering is now a skill we should all learn. You know, I've been learning it and getting better at it. So based on the prompt you give it, and my typical format for a prompt is I give it a role, I give it a task, I give it some parameters about what I'm looking for, and that real, that prompt engineering really improves the results that I get. But it's, you know, ChatGPT is text-based, so at least for now, I think of, I'm pretty sure the technology already exists, they haven't released it yet, where you can give it an image and it can read, but it can look at the pixels and tell you what it what it thinks it is. That technology already exists, I'm pretty sure. Actually, I know it does. It's not public quite yet. So, um, so eventually, and maybe it already can behind the scenes. It's just not publicly available. Where these sorts of models can look at the pixels in an image as part of the generative AI process. So, um, but it's, it's also input and outputs, right? So 
the way these models are trained is you have to tell at first, you have to kind of label what it is. That's what builds the, in the deep learning network. And then the output is its response to what you trained it as. All right. Now, of course, it can become purely, you know, purely automated at some point, probably. All right. Do I have any material for chat GPT uh, at all? No, I, I do not. One, it's so new. Two, it's, it's just sort of being refined and hammered out about how it's going to work and, um, and stuff like that. I'm not sure that is really aligned with what my channel does, at least at this point, but who knows? Maybe at some point. All right, I'm gonna grab a drink. Um, people seem to be afraid of it replacing programmers and teachers, but even Jarvis needed Tony, Tony Stark. So yeah, I mean, well, do I think it will completely replace a lot of things? completely replace them? No. There's always has to be some element of humanness. It's trained on humanness. We provided it all the material to train. So two things. There are certain things that humans are going to be able to do. Hopefully, if we believe in sort of the utopia model, you have kind of extremes about all this stuff. You have some people who believe that this sort of technology, this generative AI and AI in general will lead to like a human utopia where we are free to be more human and be more creative and have abundance and stuff like that. Then we have, on the other end, we have just complete dystopia where this is like Armageddon and there's like a 10 to 30% chance that wipes out humanity. That's where we're at right now. Um, who knows? You know, we will see. But will it completely replace a lot of things? Probably not completely. But in the ideal scenario, it replaces some of the monotonous, dehumanizing, you know, type work that it can handle and allows us to be more creative, to be, you know, more imaginative, you know, use more of our imagination, which is what humans are really good at. That, you know, machines, at least yet, or not, right? Have you seen Sal from uh, uh, from Khan Academy videos using ChatGPT like a tutor? Yes, I've watched part of that. Absolutely, you know, and that's just um, that it, it is definitely one element of it. What you know, whether or not that is going to be a panacea is yet to be determined. I think it will have a role, but you know, again. It's only trained on data we have provided it. And like, how confident are we in the responses that we get back? You know, they'll know. And of course, like ChatGPT in its default form, unless it's changed very recently, doesn't have access to the internet. And it was only trained up to what, 2021? So, you know, it's, its knowledge is dated. Um, as well. But look, you know, having something like that available to, you know, individuals or groups of individuals or countries that you don't have a large infrastructure around education or don't have the resources. This is like, it's kind of like YouTube. It's, it's better than, it's better than nothing. But is it, you know, the best sort of thing, you know, that you would, the ideal to be determined. Um, and of course, the last thing I'll say is that what open AI, what open AI trained it on is very, is almost completely United States centric, I would imagine. Right. So the training information and data for it is very, in terms of global perspectives, it's very narrow. So I think it will have to branch out, um, you know, as well from there. So if I, if I'm in another, another country, another continent where the culture is very different, history is very different and things like that, the responses I might get back out of it are very U S focused. I think that's the case. 
And of course, this is something that, since it's relatively, um, like, I installed, I installed and played around with Auto Auto G, uh, GTP, which is a, which is a Python library, uh, a Python library. But you set up a Python environment. I did mine in Anaconda. Set up a Python environment, download from GitHub, install it, set a few parameters, API keys, up and running. It's not the it's not the most aesthetically pleasing thing in the world at all yet, if you run it locally, but you know if you're used to te like text interfaces, you can really try some crazy things with it. You give it goals and it iter iteratively, you know, tries to get you toward whatever goals you have told it. So if you're if you're good at like installing. Python stuff on your computer and go with GitHub and can follow the instructions to do kind of stuff like that. I highly suggest giving it a whirl. Um, you can find tutorials on YouTube how to install it locally and try it out. It's different than ChatGPT though. I mean, you do one thing about that though is you do have to have a paid OpenAI API key. Like you can't use just regular chat GPT. You have to like go in there, put a payment method in to use the API and get the API key. And then you put that into these sort of tools. But of course, two things, it's like dirt cheap. I mean, it, it's like cents to, to, to call the API. And you can place limits. You know, you can say, you know, if it reaches a certain amount, stop and just and that just kind of protects your your stuff. But yeah, AutoGPT is something you can try out if you haven't already, if you're interested in playing around with these tools. Glenn says, we use a video process to read um, speed limit signs and determine if our van drivers are speeding. We also calculate following distance in real time. Yeah, so I think um, Amazon does stuff like this. So, and you can see this in one of two ways. You know, if you're a business, like Amazon or any other type service that has this stuff, um, obviously it's a business decision to make sure like drivers are compliant, following the laws, um, liability, your risk mitigation, stuff like that. That's the one side of the argument. The other side of the argument, it's just is that it's allowing mass tech surveillance. You know, the, t the, the techno surveillance state and techno surveillance businesses. So it's the same technology. It just depends on how it's sort of used and what sort of context. Yeah, but I figure that these sorts of things are going to become, you know, more ingrained. You know, so I think insurance, the insurance industry is going to be one of those things where they're going to require, like, sensors on everything. If you want to get insurance, like auto insurance, home insurance, whatever else, they're going to require that you install a bunch of sensors in your car, in your home, stuff like that. Health insurance might get to the point where they where you have to have some sort of biological monitoring to get insurance for them to cover you. And like, I can see it really going into some kind of areas or they'll have it where if you want, you can, you can go without those sorts of things, but you're gonna have to pay double. Like if you want privacy, if you don't want to be monitored all the time or surveilled all the time, you can do that, but they're going to make you pay more for it. So, um, but yeah, so a lot of this sort of real time image and video processing has been around somewhat to some extent for a while. So if, you, if you've ever seen production factories that look for defects or look for, you know, rotten produce or, you know, broken eggs or whatever else, they have these high speed imaging devices that can um, find those things. And then like, there's just, it happens so fast, you can't even see it. You know, they'll, they'll, it'll see something bad and, and pop it out of the process. So to some degree, this stuff has been around. It's just now it's gonna be applied to a lot of different things. So, you know, it's, it's gonna be an interesting time period. And like, I tell my friends at work and my family that this is like the first time in my life that I do not know what six months from now will look like. No idea. You know, and like with my friends and family and coworkers and stuff, we're talking about 
making plans and like doing things in a year, two years, five years. And I'm like, who the hell knows what five years from now is going to look like? I don't know what five months from now is going to look like. So we shall see, but buckle up, buckle up and do your best to learn this stuff. You know, learn how it works, you know, practice your prompt engineering skills. If you can afford, you know, one or two AI tool paid tools, get them and play around with them and see what it can and can't do. So, you know, that's what I've been doing the past few months is just really kind of getting a grasp for how this stuff works and getting a, a, a knowledge base for how it works, practically how it works. I'm not interested in like the, you know, how it's all programmed and stuff. But um, yeah, so just keep reading about it and keep watching content about it, practice it, play with it, um, and just get a feel for it. And that will, prime, will prime you and me for that matter uh, to adapt with it over time for better or worse. Um, processing those statistics on for Amazon is what I do. It does help us make our drivers better and, and get people their stuff accurately. You know, absolutely. You know, that's from a business perspective, that's absolutely true. Um, the, flip side, the flip side is that it is a form of corporate mass surveillance for whatever means. It just is. So, you know, good or bad, it isn't really, it's just that's what is going to, that's the way it's going to be. So buckle up. We also monitor the driver has on a seatbelt. Yeah. So again, just it's mass corporate surveillance, maybe for good intentioned, but it does mean everything we do, we're in a, we're, we're, we are in, you know, taking from Michel Foucault, we are now in the digital panopticon where everything we do, everywhere we go, everything we say, Everything is monitored and surveilled. So I think the most valuable thing in the future will be able to exist with minimal surveillance and minimal you know, intrusions. So that will be actually be a luxury item in the future. All right. Um, Clyde says, I worry about the growth of tech surveillance. Absolutely. Um, and there are countries around the world where that already exists, you know, where the government or a business monitors every single thing ab about a person, where they go, what they do, who they talk to, their transportation habits, what they buy, everything, you know, and do we want to, do we want to live like that? It's going to be up to us collectively if we want to live like that. The question is, can our systems and institutions keep up? which I'm skeptical, skeptical of. Um, the impending death of privacy or the erosion of being able to relax, be a human, and be spontaneous, joyful things because we're always being watched. Yeah, I agree, obviously. You know, I do fear, fear, about, fear for that. Um, but I think we should all prepare to live in a world where, you know, a modern version of a big brother is with us. So does it mean having a camera in the house where we're always being watched? That's not really what we're talking about here, but we are talking about, you know, having a being watched and followed and um, monitored and surveilled all the time, you know, all the time. Okay. All right. So I think, um, well, we're about at an hour. So if you have any last minute comments, that, that took a that took a sour turn, unfortunately. But hey, look, these tools can be scary good or scary bad. It's just how it's applied, right? You know, um, so that's going to be up to us collectively through our through our voices and through our elected leaders and who we put into these offices to um, to make policies. You know, about keeping some rain on these things. But one of the challenges, especially of this, it just struck me the other day, I was thinking about this stuff. 
is that I'm not sure if there's ever been an instance in hi human history where something this disruptively powerful and like just epochal, you know, just just crazy. I'm not sure if there's ever been something this, you know, big and important for in human history that anyone can get access to. Everyone can ac have access to it. It's just, it's it's mind boggling. You you have the free version of GPT, or you can pay twenty bucks a month to get the the plus version. But something this era defining is just available, just available. So anyway, crazy. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate uh, appreciate the super sticker. Yes, I'm going to go get some coffee um, after this. Absolutely. On that note, um, super chats, tips, super stickers, PayPal tips are welcome. That's what helps keep me going. And I literally use it for my coffee budget. I don't, you know, I don't go out and buy Ferraris and stuff like that. Um, you know, I try to keep myself going, not so I can go out and buy the Ferrari, but so that you can, if you want to someday. So anything helps. And I uh, appreciate your support, whatever else it might be, or however, however little or small or big it might be. All right, Glenn's heading out to enjoy the day. I am too as well. So, all right, everybody, um, we're about at an hour, so I don't want to take up any more of your very valuable time, any more than I already asked for just by watching videos. So we will be back here in two weeks on May Saturday, May twentieth, same time, same place. Between now and then, I hope to have a new video out. You know, continuing the time series work on correlation, uh, auto correlations and auto regressions and stuff like that. And so be looking out for that. But until then, oops, excuse me. Mm, excuse me. I think I've done that twice now. So until then, I hope uh, you have a happy and safe rest of your day. And please take care of yourself, each other, and our beautiful planet. And I will see you again in two weeks. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.